All right, folks. Well, today we get to discuss probably one of my favorite philosophers that I've ever read, that I've ever researched in all of my studies in undergrad school and in grad school. And this will be the very first of two German philosophers that we're going to end the semester with, all right? The first philosopher that we're going to be discussing, his name is George Hegel, all right? And George Hegel is extremely popular for creating two primary theories. The first theory is something called the zeitgeist, all right? I'm pretty sure maybe in your common nomenclature and when you're out with friends or some nonsense you will read on the internet that says the zeitgeist is, this is how the zeitgeist is, here's what it feels like, la la, all that nonsense. So we need to figure out what the zeitgeist is and how it functions and how it operates. But we're going to soon realize that the zeitgeist really is just kind of like a car with no gasoline in it. There's got to be something that drives the zeitgeist, and that something is called the dialectic. And the dialectic is so important that it's used in every academic discipline from English, science, art, to philosophy. So let's dive in. You see, the zeitgeist is the German word for the spirit of the times, okay? And if we remember back to our Taoism lecture, and if you remember back to what Aquinas said about God, he said that everything is in movement. All things are in movement. Nothing is stationary at all. So what Hegel discovered is that he focused on the development of the zeitgeist and how it functions throughout history. And remember, zeitgeist means the spirit of the times. And when you think spirit of the times, don't think like, you know, like a ghostly spirit. It's, it's not like a, you know, a god or an angel or something like that that's writing and telling you what's going to happen. No, no, nothing so elementary and basic. Rather, he sees the zeitgeist as like a being, all right? It's like nature. It's the lone reality, right? For instance, uh, the zeitgeist, spirit of the times, right? If we flash back to, say, the 1960s, the zeitgeist at the time was, hey, you know, racism is a kind of a cool thing, keeping women in the house, you know, that's part of the spirit of the times. Men go work, you know, women produce babies, and the world goes round, right? Or if you just keep going back in history, like say in the Roman times, the zeitgeist was, um, you know, conquer and, you know, oppress and obey. That's who they were. Vini, Vidi, Vici. I came, I saw, and I fucking conquered, right? That was the Roman zeitgeist at the time. But as we know, people die, the young take over, and when the young take over, new moralities, new ideas, new beliefs come to the forefront. And when that happens, the spirit of the times changes with the spirit of the people. So that's what he means when Hegel interprets reality in terms of shifting ways in which humans perceive the world and act to change it. Okay? So that's what the zeitgeist is. That's how we influence it. We perceive the world, right? We're the only ones that live in this world that have intelligence, that 
have the intelligence to change it. And if it can change, then it's always evolving. It's always moving, right? Take a look at Westworld, for example, right? In Westworld, the zeitgeist at the time was, hey, it's a theme park where you can go get your rocks off and just have a good time, murder, kill, and do whatever you want. But then something happened. Maeve and Dolores began to perceive their real world, their real, their real reality. And what's, and what do we see happening? They are beginning to change the world in which they live. And in that sense, those two ladies are changing the zeitgeist of what Westworld actually is. Now, sadly, we won't be able to finish the series due to this damn virus, but you could probably anticipate where it was going. So instead, let's move on. So Hegel insisted upon pursuing philosophy, right, as the study of how specifically human ways of being and human ways of perceiving the world constitute what we see as reality, right? Hegel's special twist, right, his little, you know, his catch at the end was that the zeitgeist is total reality. It is really a process. It's not a thing. The zeitgeist isn't a thing. It's not, you know, it's not like this bonsai tree that you can touch. That's not what it is. If anything, to use this metaphor, the zeitgeist, because you could say starts as, you know, something basic and simple like a trunk, but as it grows and grows and grows, then it becomes something completely different, like a beautiful bonsai, right? And that's the way it is. It's a mental activity. The zeitgeist grows just like a plant or a tree will grow, but it's got to start with something simple, right? Um, for example, back in ancient European days, there was a time, believe it or not, there was a time where religion ruled the world, where religion was the zeitgeist of every Western person, every, anyone who lived in Europe, a Westerner, right? Uh, but then something happened, like it didn't grow. It's stale, it's stagnant, right? Remember Machiavelli, what hurts someone in power is if their power becomes stale and stagnant. Well, that's what happened. And that's why when religion ruled the world, it was called the dark ages for a reason, because nothing changed, nothing evolved. Science was considered witchcraft or something like that. But then those folks began to die out. A new generation came into being, zeitgeist changed. This is what we call enlightenment, right? So that's what he means by the zeitgeist. It's total reality, but it's not something you can touch, but it's more of a mental activity. It's more like if you had to define reality as a whole, reality is the common perceptions that we all share to say that this is a good drink. This is a cigar, right? You can't, if the zeitgeist was different, people would say, oh, this, this is a, a piece of dynamite or something like that. That's not a shared reality, okay? And so he goes on to say that the zeitgeist is everything in reality, right? So it's both mind and will and what our minds perceive and the wills act upon. What does that mean? Here's his word specifically. The zeitgeist, it includes all of us and everything in human experience. It is simply the world aware of itself as a self-conscious, and thinking being.
What does that mean? Well, if you view the planet Earth as the body, human beings and our intelligence are the brain to the body of Earth. But as we evolve, as our morals and our beliefs change based on our mind, well then so too does the world change. We are the world, or in Carl Sagan's terms, we are the universe thinking about itself. That's a powerful motto. If you really think about what that means, we, we are the universe. Ah, what a sexy idea that is, right? Now, he sees that it's our ability as reasoners, right? And when he says reasoners, you know, those who have the capacity to use intelligent, rational thought. But he says that he sees that our ability as reasoners, this is what gives us the ability to glimpse totality, right? In other words, to view the world from a perspective in which there is nothing truly alien to us. It allows us to escape dualism. And what I mean by dualism is go back to your Taoism, your yin yang lecture, right? A lot of people, when they see a yin-yang symbol, they think dualist, good, evil, right or wrong. And as we know, those are, you know, kindergarten concepts of what dualism actually is. So what does he mean when he says that there's truly nothing alien or foreign to us and it escapes, allows us to escape dualism? Basically, here's what he means. And keep this in mind, this is important for the exam. There's no such thing, no such thing as the independent self. There isn't. Rather, the only thing that exists is the relational self. You are the product of your relationships. In other words, you have to be identified. Now, here's what he means by that. When he says there's no such thing as an independent self, what he means is, is let's say, for example, you live on an island, like in Lost, and you're the only person in existence. You're the only person you know. You don't even know if other humans even are real, right? Let, you are a true independent self. Well, how do you know if you're pretty? How do you know if you're ugly? How do you know if you're smart? How do you know if you're an idiot? How do you know if you're tall? How do you know if you're short? How do you know anything about yourself without an other, without a relation, right? So for you to consider yourself a redneck, for you to consider yourself to be metropolitan, for you to consider yourself to be a man of nature, you got to have other people be something different. And in that sense, you are who you think you are, because there's someone else in existence that ain't you, right? Like, I only know this is a lighter because this doesn't light anything, right? If this lighter existed independently on an island, I don't know what it does. It's not going to know what it does until you compare it to something else. And that's how you seek identity, right? Now, how does this relate to, like, there's this whole idea of there's nothing alien to us and how do we escape dualism? It's the same concept of yin and yang. Yin and yang aren't two different things. They're interdependent forces. So just like I only have brown hair because someone else has blonde hair. 
If someone else didn't have blonde hair, if everyone had brown hair, there'd be no such thing as brown hair because it would just be hair. You just have hair. Like, you don't need to identify anything. If every person in America was black, or if every one person in America was white, you wouldn't need race. You wouldn't be identified as anything. And in that sense, you're not opposite. You're not different. You're interdependent, just like we were trying to teach you with the yin-yang not being separate, but interdependent. It's a unity. We are all relational selves. And because of this relational self, uh, this feeds into the Hegelian zeitgeist, right? Because the zeitgeist says, uh, the zeitgeist develops, as we know, as history progresses, okay? It also changes because it overcomes the deep divisions and contradictions that always crop up in our limited day-to-day -day experience and perceptions of the world. And what I mean by overcoming the divisions is exactly what I meant like, I only know I have brown hair because someone else has blonde hair, right? That is a division, right? Or we live in a country that's a democracy, but we only know it's a democracy because there's another country that can be considered a socialist, right? So the only way to bridge these divisions, right, Hegel says, uh, is that over time, we have to realize that our understanding of our place in the world changes. Hegel says, as our own self-understanding changes in turn, then our knowledge of our self changes, and so does the world. Now, what the hell does that mean? I'll tell you in a second. What he means is when you were 10 years old, Right? When you were 10 years old, you viewed the world in a certain way. Everything was probably handed to you on a silver platter. Parents spoiled you. You got to do what you want. Life wasn't about responsibilities, taxes, motherhood, father. It wasn't about any of that. To a 10-year-old, their perspective of the world is what it is. But we age, we mature, right? As we age and mature, so too does the zeitgeist age and mature because remember, we affect the zeitgeist. The zeitgeist doesn't exist without us. So just like you viewed the world when you were 10 years old in a certain way, well, as soon as you turned 18, all of a sudden, you know, watching cartoons, playing with yourself in the backyard, these are no longer methods and means that are going to make you successful in life. You gotta grow the hell up, right? You gotta grow up to survive in a zeitgeist that demands that you have to do this in order to survive. So just as your worldview would change from 10 years old to 18 years old, to 25 years old, to 30 years old, your reality changes because the people who make the zeitgeist force that to change as well. So, you know, this is why like old school grandpa racists <laughs> can't really function and exist in today's time because they live in a completely different zeitgeist. They refuse to evolve and change. They want, they think that they're this independent self and they don't need to change back in my day. That was the right way. Well, piece of shit, if it was the right way back then, why did it change? <laughs> it changed because it didn't work, all right? That's the way it works. Zeitgeists evolve and change just like evolution. Evolution gets rid of the weak and embraces the strong. The evolution of the zeitgeist works the same exact way. It gets rid of the old ideas that don't work like racism, 
and uh, like mistreatment of women, and it gets rid of that nonsense and it replaces something that's stronger and what works, and that's what creates a new reality. Isn't that a cool, sexy idea? Like that just gives me so much hope for the future. Now, moving on. Uh, so why does the zeitgeist change and how do I identify it? Um, did we already discuss the zeitgeist every stage of culture? Yeah, we already discussed that. We already discussed why the zeitgeist changes. Um, uh, so the point being, right, the point being from the zeitgeist is this, and this is before we move on to the, di the dialectic, right? Remember, zeitgeist is part one of this lecture. The dialectic will be part two of the lecture. The point being to gather from all of this is that Hegel's conception of perfection, right? Because the zeitgeist ideally is supposed to keep evolving and changing until we have this like ideal perfect society. Um, but Hegel's conception of perfection, it's not found at the end of a logical argument, it ain't but it's discovered at what he says is the end of history. Because history, right? When you study history, you study the past. You study how the zeitgeist has changed from year zero to now. Like, or it depends if you take Western Civ, you discuss the zeitgeist of that. You take American history, you study the zeitgeist of that, right? So when he says that the perfect zeitgeist exists at the end of history, what he means by that is all internal contradictions, all the divisions that separate us, these dualisms that we teach children that are right or wrong, good and evil, all that is put aside. It brings an end to a country that could be reconciled with one another, right? The end of history happens when there is no divisions and everything's reconciled. I know, that kind of sounds like an idealistic pipe dream, but uh, um, I don't know. Who knows? As long as human beings keep on existing and we don't, you know, wipe each other out, maybe it could happen, you know. In the end, though, Zeitgeist has the ability to come to terms with what was apparently alien to it. That leaves it ever onwards towards self-knowledge and greater freedom. And finally, it may be concluded that since the spirit can be influenced by us, right? Remember, we control the spirit of the times, not some God, not some spirit, not some magical alien force that's, or the matrix or something that's simulating all of our moves and has everything planned out. No, we constitute the zeitgeist. And this is where he comes up with probably one of the most beautiful, thought-provoking quotations that you better know what it means for the exam. And that is this. The zeitgeist in the world is the I that is we and the we that is I the individual that is the world, right? That's what he came up with. What does that mean? The I that is we, remember, because there's no individual self. There's only the relational self. So I'm not Mario Perez. You're not Cunningham. You're not, oh shit, uh, Witten. You're not Miss Purvis. No, we are philosophy students. We are humans. Your names are about as relevant as the name of a car made in the 1970s. 
it was a name in the 70s and then it moved like it's nothing now right so that's what he means the i that is we and when he says and the we that is i that means we as a human species are exactly that we are humanity you're not a human i'm not a human jack isn't a human we are human and when you can view the world that way you overcome the divisions that separate us like person a may love the outdoors loves being a redneck loves being a four-wheeling riding loves to go fishing all that kind of stuff person b may like i don't know intellectual conversations research and discovery but that doesn't mean person a is an i and person b is an i no it just means that to use a metaphor that we're just one diamond with multiple facets right a diamond has multiple sides but it's still one diamond just like us right and that's what he means at the end when he goes the individual that is the world, right? The I that is we. So the individuals make all of us. But all of us is what makes us the I, the person, or the people. And in that sense, that's how we are the world. That's a damn romantic concept, isn't it? Only if, maybe that should be the motto of the UN. So that's the zeitgeist. But like I said at the beginning of the lecture, um, actually I'm gonna stop because it takes freaking forever for these damn things to upload to YouTube. So I'm gonna say this is Hegel part one and I'm gonna upload it and then I'm gonna record Hegel part two which is the dialectic, but you got to know both for the exam. So uh, give yourself a break, let that sink in, and we'll move on.